Hello, everybody. This is Zia's Caraval from ZK Research, and I'm back with my good friend Mark Reed Edwards for another Zcast video podcast. Uh, as always, these are done in conjunction with my media partner, eWeek. And Mark, uh, as always, it seems like it's a busy week in tech. It is, and we're going to start off with NVIDIA's earnings. Always a headline when they come out with any news these days. And um, well, what's up with the earnings? Yeah, this is a this has been the remar- a remarkable transformation of this company. This NVIDIA, if you just think back to a few years ago, NVIDIA was this little gaming company, right? That uh, not too many people really thought of, in you know, as a mainstream IT company, but they are that. The revenue of five billion dollars. The street was expecting four point eight two. So this is their first time they they crossed the five billion dollar mark for uh, for a year uh they got it even stronger than that their earnings were walking 310 a share right the street was expecting 2.81 310 a share on a company that big is pretty amazing in light of the fact that they're still growing right like a lot of times you see companies start paying dividends and you know putting up big earnings when they when the growth flattens but they grew 61 percent last year versus 55 percent last year so they're even at this size, their growth is accelerating, right? And if you look at their market cap versus, you know, rival Intel, their market cap, we're just looking at a couple of years, $336 billion, Intel is $249. I think it was just a, like six months ago that they reached market cap parity with Intel. And since then, you know, the two have certainly gone on diverging paths. Um, you know, obviously, they're, they're very well known in gaming. Uh, I think your kid knows them well. My kid knows them well. I, I think uh, whenever I look at my credit card statement, there's always NVIDIA charges on there for new, you know, <laughs> new, new graphics card. But what's really been driving this company is the stuff they've been doing in data centers and with networking. You know, they bought Mellanox, they bought Cumulus. Um, they, you know, they have their own DGX line of servers now. And so the the way Jensen described it is the data center is the new unit of compute. And what he means by that is you think of what a unit of compute used to be. It was a physical server, right, that we had in their storage and compute and all the memory and stuff like that. Now we've disaggregated that server, right? And so now we've got storage located over here. We've got it in the cloud, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the data center network is the thing that ties all those things together. And so, indeed, it's funny because the unit of compute has gotten smaller with containers, but it's also gotten bigger in that we have to treat the entire infrastructure as a single unit. Nobody does that, that better than NVIDIA. And so that's something I, you know, I, I fully expect to see, you know, them to continue to grow and become a major player. And even on the networking side, which they've never really been known for before. Um, one of the more interesting comments about their CEO, Jensen Huang, made was that he felt crypto wouldn't be a large, and I don't know if the street overreacted to this. He said it wouldn't be a big contributor to the revenue moving forward, or, or at least in the near term. And I ta- I managed to talk to uh, someone from there this morning. He, he explained that further. And he said they don't really track where their end product goes, right? So they the same cards used in graphics processing are also used in crypto. But they don't actually look and see where they're being deployed. So they don't really have a lot of visibility into it. There's been some Wall Street estimates that have said maybe 100 to 300 million per quarter. They don't disagree with that, although they said if they wanted to, they could nitpick some of the uh, the hypotheses. So basically, their statement is that um, they don't really know what crypto is going to bring. They don't disagree with Wall Street, but they don't strongly endorse it either. So it's just you know it, it is what it is. You know I, I think this is a company that um, if we if we think about what Intel was to the PC era, right? And people have asked me, will NVIDIA continue to grow at this rate? Um, NVIDIA is that to the AI era. So if you believe that AI is here for the long haul, and let's face it, we're, we're putting AI in everything. And so now there's NVIDIA GPUs and cars and Alexas, and I've got a Cisco video unit on my desk that's loaded with NVIDIA GPUs, right? The, the, NVIDIA is, I think, that important to technology innovation today, that it is, it is the intel of this era, and so I, I think we, um, um, uh, you know, we're, we're we're still in the midst of this company continuing to grow, and it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, and so if if the intel era was say twenty years from you know early nineties when you know uh, Windows uh, three came out and uh, the the 
you know, Intel became kind of a headline story and it lasted really until the last 10 years or so. Is that something you envisioned for NVIDIA? Oh, yeah. It, it, it could even be longer. What hurt Intel was that Moore's law had come to an end, right? And um, we just, we simply, um, on CPUs, you can't process things fast enough. And the GPU has almost limitless possibilities. In fact, the way NVIDIA builds their products, one of the more interesting products they built was um, they have this product called NVLink and NV Switch, in which you can, with NVLink, you can, you can join two C GPUs together. With NV Switch, you can do eight. So you can create one virtually, you know, mo uh, massive GPU. And so this, 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 the they won't run at the same scale issues as, as Intel is. So you could see this run being longer. Yeah. And it seems like, the, you know, so many things are graphics intensive, and that's probably been part of the rise of NVIDIA, I would think. Yeah, well, it's not just graphics intensive, it's, it's processing intensive. Right, right. right? So even if, even if you think of, like, the video, the, the GPUs that are used, like I said, in a, you know, in a Cisco Desk Pro, yeah. um, it's so it can understand where, like, when I stand up, the camera will actually pan with me when I move around a move room, but that requires triangulation of audio and all right. these things, right? And so, um, and now there's natural language processing built into everything. I can, you know, you can ask Alexa what the weather is. There, there's, there's, uh, AI is, is something that is, um, will, I, I think, be embedded into almost everything we do societally. So it's, uh, it's, you know, we don't have robots coming that are going to kill us. Like yeah, that. And that we we covered it a couple yeah. weeks ago. The you know the new WebEx that has all that built in that kind yeah. of uh, artificial intelligence, which actually is is kind of seamless in the way they delivered it. But behind it is is all this processing power. Yeah, well, it, it's um it, it's very difficult to make things easy, right? So, <laughs> uh, and and that's it is. It takes a lot of technological technological innovation and a lot of processing power to do that. You know, and so, um, but the great thing about NVIDIA is they've managed to democratize their products as well. So you can buy GPUs out of the cloud now, right? So slices of, you don't have to invest in multi hundred thousand dollar systems and things like that. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is a pretty interesting trend and something I'm sure we're going to talk about for, you know, Zcasts to come. Good. So a company we've talked a little bit about, AppD, uh, had its Agents of Change Transformation Report come out, and there was an event around that. Uh, I'd love to get your impressions of it. Yeah, so AppD is a Cisco company, and uh, it's also, uh, I think, the top right vendor in Gartner's APM Magic Quadrant. And it's a weird thing because you're like, well, why is Cisco buying you know, a network company buying an application performance monitoring company? Well, it's everything, we've talked about this before, but everything's kind of tied together, right? It's, it's hard to deliver a good app experience without understanding network and vice versa. And so the, the, this is something Cisco's released a couple of years, I think four years in a row now, their Agents of Transformation Report, which talks about the need for what they call full stack observability. So being able to see, you know, how all your, you know, if you think of the way an app is built now, it's built on components from all these different areas how all those things interact with each other, right? And so uh, what the report did was it looked at, you know, trends trends around that, the complexity of IT, the, the, the desire to look across the stack. The report found that 96% of IT pros now believe it's essential to monitor all technical areas across the stack. During its tra transformation 2021 digital event, which was just this week, uh, they actually had a couple customers talk. One of them was Adam Rasner from AutoNation. And he actually talked about I think what most companies typically have is what they had, which is um, a bunch of disparate management tools that, that you have to try and analyze the data across the manual. And I've referred to that as swivel chair management, right? Where I've got this dashboard, this dashboard, this dashboard, right? And then so trying to understand the trends across it is, is a lot of manual work. Uh, Mr. Razor talked a lot about the importance of full stack observability, particularly where they're going. They want to start using They've got a partnership coming with Mercedes-Benz. He talked about to use virtual reality to showcase driving experiences and things, right? If, if that kind of thing doesn't work, then you actually wind up turning off customers. And so he said, his, since they put in AppD, their severity one issues um, have actually dropped by 90%. So that's a pretty staggering number, right? Yeah. So 
the the report did name four main anxiety points for IT. One of them was um, um, just new priorities and challenges, and obviously the COVID, that's no surprise. Technology sprawl was another one, acceleration of cloud computing and the multiple disconnected solutions. And so those are all trends that I think have accelerated because of COVID. Um, I can tell you something, Mark, that um, I've, do, I've done a lot of work with a lot of enterprises in their digital transformation plans. And whenever they have a project fail, it's because of lack of IT readiness that some somewhere, some you know, in that IT stack, they weren't ready. You know, I'll give you an example of a high-end retailer. They, you know, they, uh, and I don't know if you knew this, but in high-end retail like Louis, Gucci, things like that, almost all the sales are impulse buys. People don't go into those kind of stores and know what they want to buy. So the ability to show more merchandise actually has a, has a huge uplift effect, right? So the way it's done traditionally is they run in the back and get merchandise. They come back, they run, it's very manually intensive. So they put a tablet program in place. And what was happening was there was a, a problem between like one of the web servers and the network, but it took them months and months to solve that, right? If you had that full stack observability, you'd be able to focus in on that. And so I think as we move forward, as companies become more digital, as there's more focus on employee and customer experience, full stack observability becomes yeah, um, you know, important. And I urge everybody to read that report. Actually, it was a good report. It's, I know it's sponsored by an application performance management company, so it leads you to that. But there was a lot of good data in there that talks about the challenges of, of digital processes. Yeah, and that, for a high-end retailer to have a salesperson out on the floor with a tablet who can kind of clear the way, clear the obstacles so that someone can make a purchase is, is incredibly powerful, I would guess. Yeah, and I talked to one of the people in the store about it, and they said that uh, the, the the process was working so badly that they actually put the tablets on the shelf. So it was, you know, the, the it took them a long time to figure out where the problems were. So um, remember you know, Bill Belichick uh, using uh, a tablet on the sidelines, and it wouldn't work, and he just threw it away. And, and yeah, I remember the paper said, I'm again. Done. I'm done with the Microsoft Surface, and I'm thinking <laughs> Microsoft's pretty big sponsor of the NFL, so that couldn't have gone over well. Yeah, or initially when they when they started sponsoring, the announcers were even calling them iPads. That's yeah, kind of that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a different issue, but yeah, that's but that but that shows right. This, the NFL is trying to digitally transform even the way they coach, right? But with, without the ability to be able to see what's going on up and down the stack, it's very difficult to troubleshoot. Yeah. So this, it also, I think, helps through the historical way. Um, and um, I, I get, uh, you know, it's funny that uh, a lot of the management vendors that work in silos say that their whole goal is to provide mean time to innocence, which is like, it's not my fault. But that doesn't ultimately help the, the problem, right? It just makes it not yours, where the goal should be mean time to resolution, but a lot of vendors use that mean time to innocence thing. It's like, well, we just want to show it's not the network's fault or yeah. not the storage manager's fault. It's like, well, that's fine and dandy, but that doesn't actually get the customer experience back, right? So yeah, you really want the one throat to choke, right? Yeah, that yeah, that's <laughs> I find that a funny experience because you're assuming something's going to go bad. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so so Salona and Ensego are collaborating on something that's really relevant these days, uh, bringing LTE and 5G benefits to enterprise networks. Yeah, Salona and Ensego, actually, they're kind of hard to say together. Uh, anyways, Salona is uh, not a very well-known company. They are, uh, I believe, the only uh, enterprise-grade private 5G company. And so if you think of 5G, we tend to think of um, you know, the Verizon's AT&T Vodafone's, or from an equipment perspective, we think of Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, companies like that, right? Or maybe here. Um, but, but those are really like carrier grade ones. Right. And most enterprises aren't going to go, um, you know, take, can, you know, can you picture the IT guy, the Yankee group running, you know, getting some Ericsson equipment and dropping that in. What Salona has is a 5G system that sets up like Wi-Fi, it looks like Wi-Fi. You've got things that, you know, the radios, but they're really, they set up like access points. And so, but it brings the benefits of 5G to uh, enterprise. And so I don't believe that we're going to see a 5G completely displaced Wi-Fi, like Pat Gelsinger predicted at uh, VMworld. Uh, I think Wi-Fi is cheap, it's ubiquitous. 
Um, uh, you, if you think of like a, this laptop I'm working on, um, you, you know, you can get a low end Chromebook for with Wi-Fi for a few hundred bucks. Uh, you know, the low end Lenovo laptop with uh, integrated 5G is 1500, right? So it's not great for everything, but for critical use cases, mission critical systems, IOT systems, you think of companies that as people start coming back to work, uh, they want to put up uh, temperature sensors and, uh, you know, the environmental scanners and things like that. Those could all be, those are all mission critical systems that you, you'd want to connect over 5G. And so what Salona has is this 5G, this enterprise grade 5G system for in-building. Insego is a company uh, that does, uh, has a intelligent IoT device to cloud solution. So there, you can think of them playing in the ability to connect a lot of legacy IoT devices to the network. And the two of them can, you know, I, I think very nicely, they brought a joint solution to allow companies to, you know, attach all these legacy devices to a network and then bridge it over to the, the 5G. So it brings the benefits of 5G to legacy devices and enterprise networks. And I think this is a trend that's going to be really interesting to watch because the Wi-Fi industry has continued to evolve by taking aspects of 5G, right? So if you look at the you know, the way the orthogonal frequency multi-division works and, you know, the way um, even, um, you know, multi-user MIMO works. Those, were all, those all came out of the cellular world. So if we're going to take, if we're trying to make Wi-Fi look more like cellular, then just use cellular, right? It's, it's, a, it's a better technology for those mission critical systems. And I think historically it didn't because Wi-Fi was always faster than, than cellular, but now cellular speeds and Wi-Fi speeds are on par with one another. So, uh, I, you know, I was, the, we had talked about the partnership that uh, Extreme has with the Major League Baseball last week and uh, Ryan Shield, the CEO of the Sox, they are looking at bringing some 5G into the building as well uh, for different use cases. So I, I think 5G is, is, if you're a network manager and you're watching this and 5G is not on your radar, it should be. And by the way, Solona partners with HP, so you could buy it as an Aruba solution if you wanted the service and support around it. But I do think you'll see really all the network vendors, uh, you know, get into private 5G. So. Which is more scalable for, for say, say you've got a campus with a few thousand employees on it with several buildings. Would you use both, depending on the application, I guess, right? Yeah, you could use both. You could salt and pepper it is the expression where you've got a mix of the two. I, I think you would use, again, you'd use Wi-Fi for your, you know, if you had like a university campus, just average access, you know, students roaming around, it's fine for that. But all my mission critical systems, alarm systems, maybe in my research labs, those kind of things, I'd attach those over 5G. Because it's a licensed spectrum, right, you don't get the same interference. Somebody turning on a microwave doesn't affect it. You know, one of the big problems that, especially in, in very dense areas that Wi-Fi has a problem, is he who has the strongest radio uh, wins. Right. right. And so you you do wind up getting a lot of interference. And so 5G is not subject to all. This. And so it's, it's, it's cleaner and uh, but it is more expensive. And so you got to weigh kind of performance and, and cost. And so cost, if, if cost is an issue and, you know, it's just sort of general use cases, uh, Wi-Fi is fine. But Wi-Fi can get saturated pretty fast. I think we've all been in this situation where we sat in a conference room and, you know, before you know, the, the keynote starts where, you know, we're all tweeting and, uh, you know, Facebooking and things like that. And then it starts and nobody can do anything. Right. right? So with, with 5G, you wouldn't get those problems. So it's, um, it's this, this is, uh, this, the, to me, 5G is one of the, uh, one of the, the, the big, we talked about AI before in this, but, but 5G right along with that is one of the big transformational technologies we're going to see over the next decade. Until the 6G anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I think, um, you know, that kind of covers the big news of this week. Uh, we'll be back next week with another video. Uh, I want to thank everybody for watching us. On behalf of my host, Mark Reed Edwards, and my media partner, Ewee, comes Zias Caravalla. Thank you for watching.